Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let's all stand together this morning. Welcome to the house of God. Welcome to St. Simon's Christian Renewal. It's an honor to have you with us today to worship the Lord in person as well as Facebook Live. Psalm 150 says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty firmament. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Who has experienced God's mighty acts today? Amen. You woke up this morning, didn't you? Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. So, Father, today we lift up Your name, the name above all names, the name of Jesus. We worship You today. We honor You. We glorify You today. May everything that's said and done bring glory and honor and attention to You, Lord. And we praise You in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. You'll hear the sound of a shofar. Let's worship the Lord together. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll find you to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh boy. I'll fly away in the morning, and I die. Hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly away. When the shadows of this life have grown, I'll fly away. Like a bird from prison bars has flown, I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Just a few more early days in hell, I'll fly away To a land where joy shall never hear, I'll fly away I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away Fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. I'll fly away. I'll fly away. Good morning. Who can stop? 
Father, you are such a good, good Father. We're just so humbled to be in your presence this morning, God. We just worship you, Lord. We adore you, God. We just thank you, God, for who you are. God, we come to you this morning, Lord. We lift up the needs that are represented in the bulletin today. God, we lift up Susan Adams. We lift up Kevin Nowen, Ann Johnson, Pam Brown, Heather Dowdy, Pam Davis, Linda Morton, Luann Silva. God, we ask that you just come to these people that need healing right now, God. We ask that you just bring 100% health and wholeness to their bodies. We plead the blood of Jesus over these needs, Father. God, we ask that you not only bring spirit, um, physical healing, God, we ask that you bring spiritual healing to lives that need it this morning, God. God, we ask that you bring deliverance to ones that need it, Lord, Father, God. In the name of Jesus, we just... We just storm heaven this morning, God, for all the needs that are on our hearts, Lord. God, there's so many needs that no one even knows about that are on our hearts, hearts, Father. God, we ask that you just go to the deepest places of our hearts, God, and that you bring healing. Lord, I pray that you'll just set us free from things that are holding us back, God. Lord, help us not to be concerned with what's happening on the left or the right, God. I pray, God, that you help us not be concerned what people think about us, Lord that we just completely surrender to you today, God, that we just bring our whole heart and our soul to you this morning, Father. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we worship you today. And God, as Pastor Mike comes to bring your word, Lord, I thank you for the anointing on his life and his heart. I thank you for the word you have given him. God, we ask that you just anoint our hearts and our ears to hear your word today and to receive what you have for us today. In your precious holy name, I pray. Amen. Is anybody thankful for the rain? Yeah. Amen. I'm thankful for the rain. It's going to put a damper on our bonfire this afternoon, but I'm thankful for the rain. We need the rain to kind of wash out some of this green pasty stuff that's been uh, sticking to driveways and nasal passages amen so pray pray god will just wash it all out and uh, we'll postpone the bonfire looks like we need to postpone that to next sunday so there will be a uh if you notice in the bulletin for you ladies there will be a, a wedding shower for nishini and juan next sunday afternoon here amen They will be getting married on May 1st, and they've invited all of us to the wedding. Isn't that sweet? Amen. Amen. Congratulations. That's right. So, Nishini and Juan will be getting married. I, I, there's no use in long engagements, right? When God puts you together. So, uh, they'll have a baby uh, wedding shower. <laughs> I said that to Crystal earlier, and I knew I'd caught myself, but uh, I didn't that time. There'll be a wedding shower, 3 o'clock for the ladies here, but us men will be getting ready for the bonfire at 4 o'clock outside, so we'll, we'll have back-to-back -back festivities next Sunday right here. Uh, Crawford has a friend, Jerry Wainwright, we've been praying for for the last few weeks. Last Sunday I told you about answered prayers in that Shag Strickland had been praying about cancer and went back for some tests week before last and God had healed him of cancer. Well, this week, Amen. We've been praying for a friend of Crawford's, Jerry Wainwright, and uh, it didn't look good, did it? The doctor's run a test and a lot was going on. She's cancer-free. So praise God for that report. <laughs> and we're believing for your miracle today, too. Amen? Keep believing, keep praying. Speaking of prayer, every Monday night here at 630, we have prayer meeting. Prayer 517 meets here in the sanctuary. And we know that the prayer 
of all of us that we offer up to the Lord, he hears every single prayer. How can he hear all of our prayers at one time? Because he's God. He hears every prayer. All around the world this morning, God knows every word everyone is speaking. God is an awesome God, and he answers our prayer. And we thank God for healing Jerry Wainwright. Pray for continued uh, healing in her body and her life. Amen. This past Sunday, we started a series following Easter Resurrection Sunday. And the price that Jesus paid on the cross for us, it, it was many things, but our salvation was among, among what he paid for on that cross. Death, hell, and the grave is what Jesus conquered, the Bible says. And as we come out of the resurrection season, I wanted us to focus on some of the things that he paid for. And one thing that, that he did that's so awesome for us as Christians is that he forgave us before we ever sinned. He extended forgiveness to us. And how important is forgiveness? We talked about that Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave after he spoke the words, I forgive them. And so if Jesus can conquer death, hell, and the grave after a forgiving heart, what can we conquer? What can we do in this life if we also have a heart of forgiveness? As we know, the Bible says in Mark eleven twenty five, 25, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. God wants to give us forgiveness, but he also wants to pour forgiveness out of us into others. It's probably one of the most difficult things that we have to do in our walk is to forgive. But if we remember that God forgives us of all of our many sins, it makes it easy, doesn't it? So let's pray, and I want to delve into what I believe the Lord wants to speak to us this morning. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word, Lord. It's life. It's light. It's encouragement. It's food for our soul. God, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts today. Draw us closer to you. I pray, God, that I will say exactly what you want me to say, Lord so that our hearts will be enlightened and open to receive all that you want to do today. It's in Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. It's one thing to forgive. We admit that's difficult enough. Then it's another thing to forgive someone that you know they intentionally offended you. They planned an offense. They, they had an offense planned. They set out to offend you. And we're to forgive them. Now, like I said last Sunday, we can think of some great legitimate excuses to withhold forgiveness. That would be one good one. That would be at the top of the list. You meant to do it. You're intentional. So I can withhold forgiveness for a certain time and let you pay and be punished for a little bit. And we, the whole, the whole while we're the one being punished because we're holding the offense in our heart and we're not letting God flow through us the way that he wants to flow through us. Unforgiveness, withholding forgiveness in our heart will hinder our life. Not only with the Lord, it'll hinder our life with the Lord and blessing, but it'll also hinder our physical life, our health, as we talked about last week, emotionally. There are two things that, important things in our life that will be hindered by not forgiving, and that is our time and our mind. Our time is hindered because we're consumed with thinking about that thing, thinking about that offense, thinking about how it hurt, the time that goes into that. And then when we're not thinking about it, it's always in the back of our mind our time, and then our mind, our thoughts, the things that we should be thinking about to be productive to do what God's called us to do. Our mind is consumed with that thing because it's at the center. It's, it's almost the, the root of where we're operating from. So our time and our mind is, is consumed when we don't forgive, when we do not act in forgiveness. But I believe that our time and thoughts can be most fruitful when we choose to forgive. Forgiveness is a choice. It's not, it's not something you feel like doing. You wake up tomorrow morning and say, Oh, I feel like forgiving. It's a choice. So when we make that choice to forgive, it releases fruit in our life, in our time, and in our mind, in our thoughts, and all that we have, our emotions, our spirit man, to do greater things, to do great and fruitful things. You'll find that when you choose to forgive, that there's a peace that comes over you that cannot be achieved any other way. There's a release. And sometimes it takes time for that process to develop. Now, Jesus, when he spoke forgiveness, we knew that the fruit of that happened immediately. And so Jesus also had reason not to forgive, but he forgave. But as we, as we, sometimes we have to say that thing before we actually feel it. In other words, we have to choose to speak forgiveness. I choose to forgive. And then the, the, uh, the heart of that will follow behind it. Now, I'm not one to say that 
that you need to make a phone call this afternoon to call someone that has hurt you or offended you and said, by the way, I want you to know what you did to me and I forgive you. Sometimes that could stir up a little more than what stir the pot as the old saying goes. So forgiveness many times is dealt with in our own hearts. If the Lord opens the door for you to go back and, and to make things right, and many times that is the case, that, that you need to go back and make things right and speak to someone's life. But allow God to open that door. Don't go out of your way to, with, a, with a gritting of teeth to take somebody a pitcher of sweet tea and say, I forgive you. <laughs> we wait for God to open those doors and, and we do that. So I want to talk a little more about this today and how important it is in our life to forgive, to release, and make a decision to do so. We've all been offended. We've all been offended. There have been offenses in our life. And as I'll, as I'll talk more in a more moment and elaborate on this, we know that, that the devil will set up things in our life to cause us to be offended, even if it wasn't meant to be as that. Sometimes we can be offended easily. We get, on the, get, off, get off on the wrong side of the bed, and, and everything that's said, we're offended by it. Well, why did you say it that way? Why are you looking at me like that? What do you mean by that? Why aren't you talking to me? You haven't spoke all morning. So we're offended by every little thing because why? Because we're in a, uh, we're, we're, we're in a state of everything, whatever happens, we're going to be offended by it. Jesus gives us fair warning that we will be, we will be offended in Matthew 24.10. This is what he said. And then many, in the Greek that means majority, many will be offended will betray one another, and will hate one another. How would you like to start your day tomorrow reading that verse? <laughs> but he's given us warning that we will be offended. We will betray one another, we'll hate one another. The meaning of the word offended here means as a trap. It's a trap set up. This offense can be a trap. And how many know we can do one of two things when we face a trap, when we come into a uh, when we confront, if you're walking through the woods and you see a bear trap, you have two choices. Either go out around it or step right in the middle of it. And so offenses many times are trapped us. It's a trap. We can either walk in the middle of it and we know havoc will explode. It'll be a mess. Well, I've got a point to prove to them, so I'm going to go ahead and step into it and make my point. That's not the point. We're being caught in the trap and our hearts will also be hindered by that offense. Or we can sidestep it. Many times, we as men, I, I, know, I know guys, we as men, we're always right. So many times we have to let, I'm kidding. We think we are. But many times when we're trying to true, prove our point, the best thing we can do is to just shut it down. Just, just let it ride. Even though we think we've got the answer, we think we've got it all right. Many times the best thing for us to do to stop that offense, to step around that trap, is just to take a breath and listen. And so we can get caught in the trap of offense. Jesus is warning us that offenses will come. We will be offended. And he tells us again in Luke 17, 1, he says it this way. Then he said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come. That's pretty strong. It is impossible that no offenses should come. But woe to him through whom they do come. In other words, that's leaving, that's leaving room for the Lord to take care of those offenses. They're again stepping around the trap, letting the Lord take care of it, not letting it stick to us, and going forward in what God wants us to do. We will be offended. You can turn on the television this afternoon on any of your choice news channels, and you will be offended by something. And so we can carry that offense, or we can use it as an opportunity to pray for our leaders and for our nation God to come into America like he's never come to America before to help us to be a light to a dark world. So, so it's a matter of what we do with the offenses. We can be bogged down in the offenses or we can use those to encourage us to draw close to the Lord and to allow him to take care of these just like he promised that he would. So we cannot avoid offenses, but we can control how they affect our lives. We cannot avoid offenses, but we can control how they affect our lives. Proverbs 18, 19 says, a brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. We've all been offended. Some could be carrying offenses this morning. Some 
Some will carry offenses for 20, 30, and 40 years. It's hard to win. Harder to win, it says. that It doesn't say it's impossible. It says it's harder to win than a strong city. During this time, there were walls built around cities. And they were built around cities to keep the enemies from coming into the city. So there were walls, thick and strong, to stop the enemies from coming in. Well, when we build those walls around us, we, we intentionally build those walls when we're offended. We're offended the second time. Those walls get a little thicker. Offended the third time, a little thicker. Till before you know it, when you're in your 50s and you've been offended so many times, those walls are so thick you can't hear anything, much less see anybody. Right? And, that, and, and we choose to do that. We choose to put those walls up. But they do keep out the enemies, but they also keep out fruitful people and those that want to speak, those that are important relationships in our life, including God himself, that can't penetrate that wall to get to our heart. We've put up the guard so high that we have ward off offenses, but we've also warded out the important relationships that God has put in our life to speak to us, to help us. And you know what? Sometimes it's good for us to be offended because the purpose of that is to push us closer to God, not to push us further away. When we take those offenses to heart, we push ourselves away from God. And so that's the enemy's plan for doing that. But if we allow God to, we leave the walls down. That means that we get all kind of little, little different things coming in, and we have to learn to be relying on God and how to see through God's eyes. But we learn what those things are that are important to our lives to receive those and to help us make, make us stronger. And that's a totally another topic, another subject. That's one of the fruits of the Spirit that, that, that the Lord will give us in our lives so that we can become keen and hear His voice so that we can determine which one is good and which one is not good. That's important as well. But we cannot live the abundant life and the happy life that God has given us with walls around us. So we've got to take the walls down. That means we'll be offended at times. Offenses could be in the form of a betrayal, someone whom you trust has turned their back on you, someone who you trust has falsely accused you, told lies about you, didn't agree with what you did, your motives were misjudged, you could have been rejected, you let your guard down and you were rejected, you were not accepted, you could be abused, you could have been taken advantage of emotionally, financially, in your relationship, not treated kindly, or you could have been humiliated in front of somebody, making fun and being that you're embarrassed in a different way and so all these offenses can can come to you but these happen to be the same offenses that Jesus faced and was railed against him Jesus also was betrayed Jesus also was falsely accused Jesus Christ was falsely accused he was rejected by many he's rejected by many today he was abused and he was humiliated as we know the story of Jesus going to the cross, dying, going to the grave, and then resurrecting on the third day. The Bible says that Jesus experienced all the offenses. Everything that we face or will ever face, Jesus has already experienced those things. Why? Because he can also relate to us as we experience these things. We can never say, nobody has been where I'm at. Jesus Christ has. He's been where you are, and he's at the same place that you may find yourself tomorrow or next week. So Jesus experienced the same offenses. Hebrews 2, 17 and 18 says, Therefore, in all things, Jesus had to be made like his brethren. He, speaking of Jesus, had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people, pay the price. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. That's us. That's us. You say, well, I'm never tempted. Many times we're tempted to be offended. We're tempted to say something in response to an offense to us. We're tempted in many ways throughout the day, and we have choices in those temptations. Jesus has also been tempted, and he knows the way that we need to go. He was tested in all accounts. 1 Peter 4, 1 says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. Well, isn't that interesting? We're given the answer to the sufferings. We're given the answer to the offenses. We're given the answer to these things that we're going to face that even Christ suffered for. But we're to have the same mind. Can we have the same mind as Christ? Yes, we can. It says also for us to have the same mind. For he 
who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So our way of thinking is important to our reaction to offenses, the way we think. I'm not saying we will become perfect, that we will think like Jesus and everything that we do. I mean, we're still human. We're still in human form. Even Jesus had thoughts that, that he didn't act upon. Even he was tempted, the Bible says. So temptation is not wrong. Temptation is not sin. It's what we do beyond that point. It's what creates the sin and the wrong in our life. So the way Jesus thought is the same way that we can think. Our mind is the transmission to what we do. It's, in other words, we've got a motor here and our mind sets that thing forward. So, so our actions is a response of our thoughts. So it's important that we, that we pay attention to our mind and how we think and who we are. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. So we've got to renew our mind so that we think like Christ. If we let our mind just go astray, just let it wander off, just walk through the woods, just, just let it wander, la, la, land, and here and there, our minds will wind up anywhere. But we're to conform to the renewing, we're to trans- be our, have our minds transformed by the renewing of our mind, that you may prove, goes on to say, what is that good and acceptable, and watch, the perfect will of God. We can experience the perfect will of God by renewing our mind. Wow, that's powerful. Because as our mind goes, our actions will go. And it's something we as humans have to work at. Wouldn't it be great if right now our minds are renewed and our actions are done and everything that we struggled with five minutes ago is totally gone? That would be great. But we have the power to do that. But we also have to have the faith to continue to act in that. Because this afternoon we may feel differently than what we feel now. We feel, may feel weak. We feel, oh, I, I feel like worrying. I'm, that thing is worrying me again. I conquered it this morning at, at 11 o'clock at church. But now I'm struggling with that worry, that anxiety again. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And so we step back in that thing again. That's the point. We renew our mind again. That's why Paul said, pray without ceasing. It's not that we continually are on our, on our knees before God praying, and that's fine, that's good. But we can have an attitude and a heart of prayer 24-7 so that we're always, that, we're always on Wi-Fi. It's a clear signal. Rain, shine, it doesn't matter, snowstorm, that Wi-Fi is always open. We've also always got that line open to him, and we're always in continual prayer. We never end that prayer. We pray one prayer a day, that's 24-7. It's kind of like I only eat one meal a day. It's when I get up and I go to bed, it's just one meal. So we pray without ceasing. We pray continually to God that our mind be renewed in Him. It's important in our health. The way you think will affect your health. The way you think will affect your health. The way you think will affect your relationships. The way you think will affect your emotions. The way you think will affect your finances. Every part, mind, soul, and spirit, every part of your life will be affected by the way you think. So he says, renewing our mind, that's important. We're talking about forgiveness. Well, forgiveness is going to come easy after we renew our mind. If we're bogged down in all the hurts and all the offenses, our mind isn't renewed. And it's going to be, that's, that's why in Proverbs a while ago it said it's, it's difficult because we've got those walls around us. We're still in that that small frame mindset God doesn't have a small frame mindset he he throws out all the traditions and he says I'm going to forgive anyway even though you intentionally sinned against me Jesus says I choose to forgive you our actions are a direct response to our thinking our thinking can cause us to harbor offenses or our thinking can cause us to release offenses It's interesting, last Tuesday, this past Tuesday, we were in Blackshire at the FCMI meeting and had a group there, and we all went to lunch together and, and somehow got on this track talking about how Jesus reacted to Judas. Well, it happens to be where, where I'm at today and what I want to share just for a couple of minutes on Jesus' reaction to Judas. But Jesus treated Judas 
just like he did the other disciples. The Bible tells us that Jesus already knew that he would be betrayed by Judas, and, and Jesus still loved Judas, still spent time with Judas, still poured into him. Why would Jesus waste his time on Judas when he knew that he'd be betrayed by him? Isn't that interesting? He knew he'd be betrayed by this guy and left him in the inner circle. I believe it's to show us today what forgiveness truly is. John 6, 64 says, But there are some of you who do not believe, Jesus said. Jesus knew from the beginning who they would, who, who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. Jesus knew that Judas would betray him. And in John, uh, look down a few scriptures to verses 70 and 71 of John 6. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? That's pretty strong. One of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray Jesus, being one of the twelve. Jesus intentionally didn't allow this offense by Judas to hinder his thinking or his actions. So Jesus' thinking, his actions, his word, his transparency to Judas and all the others didn't change because of Jesus knowing him. You say, well, if I had only known that person would betray me, then I would have... Maybe it's good that we don't know so that we can still live the life of Christ in front of those who may betray us. We talked last Sunday. I love Pastor Ligon describes these this verse in Matthew 5, perfectly. But we talked last Sunday about the four actions that Jesus models for us. In Matthew 5, we're not going to go there again. We, we broke it down last week, but it says, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. So we're to love, to bless, to do good, and to pray for those that will betray us. That's exactly what Jesus did. Was Jesus hindered because of that betrayal? He was hurt. I'm sure he was affected by it, but it did not hinder Jesus. We're leaving room then for the Lord to take care of the actions of others. It's not our responsibility to treat them to their punishment. It's, 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 it's God's place to treat them to their punishment in his own timing and probably will not be our timing. It's not going to happen in the next five minutes. Well, God, could you do it quickly and do it so I can video it and enjoy it later? He's not going to do that. Why? Because he wants our heart in the right place to him. So we're not hindered. If we did see it and videoed it, then we're caught up in that pride. And the Bible says that a fall will come when pride is involved. And so Jesus' view to Judas was this in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. Aren't you thankful for God's long-suffering toward us? We want God's long-suffering, but not necessarily to those who betray us. Well, it's for every person living. Jesus died for those of us who sin. He came to die for those, all of us, who would ever sin, including our enemies, including us. But is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all, say all, all should come to repentance. I believe that Jesus, in his heart, was hoping for Judas to come to repentance and to realize who he was. He was giving room for Judas to come. That's the grace of God. You say, well, I could never give anybody that grace. Well, we could if we realize how much grace has been extended to us. We've been extended that same grace. God loves us. It should be easy for us to pour it out. It's not against us anyway. Any offenses really is against God because of who you are in him. We shouldn't take it personally. Jesus' heart is to forgive. Not only to forgive, but to actively pursue the opportunity to forgive. Wow. Jesus doesn't only want to forgive, he wants to look for the opportunity to forgive. Did you get that? That's not a reason, that's not an excuse for us to sin. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. It's, it's uh, encouragement for us to push even closer to him because we understand how great his love is. I want to be even closer to him. I want to walk even closer to him. So if 
I do fall, he's there to pick me up. And I can trust him that he loves me so much, he's there to pick me up, brush me off and say, let's go. Don't let this stop you. And so that increases my love even more for Christ, that I trust him, that I love him, that I follow him, that I listen to him. I know he has the best thing for me. And so it's not a reason to get out of things. You know, like when we were kids, we looked for the opportunity to, to hide, to do things, and, and take my bicycle when I'm 11 years old and go to my friend's house, buddy's house, and hide in the woods and do no good. I mean, that, that's not what... And my mom always found out. She had eyes in the back of her head. She knew what I was doing. She waited for me to get home, and she wore me out. Thank God. But in Luke 23... Verse 34 says, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Jesus is hanging on the cross here. Jesus is dying. And he says, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. Do you really think that they didn't know what they were doing? They knew what they were doing. But Jesus in his heart, he said, they don't really know what they're doing. Forgive them. They knew. But the way Jesus saw them, he saw them in their innocence, even when they were guilty. Wow. Even in our guilt, even while we're yet sinners, Jesus sees us in our innocence. So the way, is it possible for us to see through the eyes of Jesus, to see those who offend us as innocent? It is. It's not human. It's supernatural to see through the eyes of Jesus, to see those who offend us as innocent before Christ. Jesus chose to see these innocent, even after all that they did. They intentionally hurt him. They intentionally hung him to a cross. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. Jesus hates sin, but Jesus loves the sinner. There's a huge difference. My mama loved me, but she didn't like it when I did something that she told me not to do. Right? So I, I received punishment for the things that I chose to do that was against what she told me to do. But she loved me the very moment that I was running out in that yard and I tripped and busted my head right there on the back of that go-kart. I was running to the go-kart to get on that thing to crank it real quick, one more ride around the yard. And I tripped and busted my head on the corner of that old Briggs and Stratton motor. You know, back then, there weren't guards and helmets and all that stuff. You just jumped on it. And, and so I busted my head. Well, she came running out there, put me in the car, got a towel, put it on my head. And I might have been eight or nine years old, rushed me to the hospital. That's how much my mama loved me. She wasn't thinking about the things that I had done wrong and how she was going to wear my behind out. She was thinking about how much she loved me because I was her son. And so Jesus hates sin. He doesn't condone our sin. Don't, so we, don't, we, don't, we don't need to get that confused. Well, God's favor is on me and I can do anything I want to do and he loves me. He loves you, but if we go against his commands, he'll punish us. In Matthew 18, where we see the story of, of the shepherd going, leaving the 99. I love that story, Crawford. How he leaves, left the 99 and went for that one that was lost. Who's not to say that that one that was lost left intentionally? Maybe he said, you know what, he's not looking right now, so I'm going to go off and do my own thing. And so the actions of the shepherd was not based on the intention of the sheep. He went after him anyway. He chose that he would take time away from those 99 to go get that one. Whether he intentionally left or whether he just went off on La La Land and didn't know where he was. So he left. See, Jesus' heart for us is that he wants us to be where he is. Whether we intentionally walk away, that doesn't break down his love for you at all. He loves you with an unconditional love. But our actions, he wants to draw us closer to him. He, he doesn't go out there and set up a cabin beside the one and say, okay, we can camp out here while the 99, they can stay there a week or so. They're fine for a little bit. We'll see. No, his intention is to bring that one back into the fold. And okay, now we've got all 100 together. We're all good. We're all safe. And let me show you what we need to do next time so we can stay together. So he loves us so much that he corrects us, that he goes and gets us when we're at fault. 
brings us back in. The three things I want us to remember about forgiveness. That is, everyone needs forgiveness. Every single person, the moment they're born, needs forgiveness. That's why Jesus died, to forgive, to save that which was lost. We were born lost. This world, because of Adam and Eve, here we are. And you know what? If one of us was Adam and Eve, we'd have done the same thing they did. We can point fingers and say, well, if they had done, th you know what? If we were there, we'd have done the same thing. But because of that, we need Jesus Christ. We need forgiveness. We've all gone astray. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned. We're all together. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Jesus forgives us over and over. How many times has Jesus forgiven me? I don't even know. But I know that he forgives me unstopped. He, he doesn't put a limit. He doesn't give me so many stars per day and said, okay, Mike, when you surpass those stars, I, I can't forgive you anymore. He forgives me. He looks at my heart, sees when I'm, when I'm really, truly sorry for my sin, and he forgives me. We will never, ever forgive someone else as many times as Christ has forgiven us. Never. Matthew 10, 8 says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. We realize that we have been given so much. Like Elder Roth was talking a while ago, God has blessed us so much, it should be so easy for us to bless others because you know what? Our supply is from God anyway. Whatever we have need of, we will be supplied that very thing so that we can continue to pour out. That's the way the river is. The river, a healthy river, is one that flows. A stagnant river, the one that has mosquitoes and stinks, is the one that is stagnant, that does not flow. So I want us to have some good smelling rivers around here. Amen. Freely you've received, freely give. Secondly, the thief is our enemy. I touched on this a moment ago. The thief is our enemy. Jesus says this about our enemy in John 10.10. 10. The thief, Jesus says, does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's what he came to do. And we've got to remember that that person is not our enemy. The thief, the devil, is our enemy. He goes on to say, I've come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Ephesians 6.12 gives us clarity on the enemy. It says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So, so we like to see our enemy, and we put our face on the enemy, and put our arm on our enemy, and so that we can fight, we can say things to hurt. And when, when, we, when we can't identify a face with an enemy, we, we don't know what to do with it. Well, we take it to the Lord in prayer on our knees. He says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Yes, the devil uses people. Sometimes the devil uses us. We have to be careful not to be used by the devil. That's why we have to stay close to God. I don't want to be used by the devil. I want to be used by the Lord. Our life our life center, our mind, as our mind draws closer to him, we're going to think like him, and we're going to know the difference between a God instruction and a devil instruction. But we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. We can look all around us today, people who are not in church, and they're crying out for somebody to listen to them. Even those that are showing themselves and doing things that are off the wall and different, many of them are just crying out for somebody to listen to them and to give them an ear to understand where they are. We're not wrestling against people. We're re wrestling against principalities, against powers. And lastly, we need to remember that we're to receive God's love. You say that sounds really simplistic. It is. But many times we act out of not receiving God's love. Do we truly know how much he loves us. When we, when we recognize that, when we realize how much He loves us, it causes us to act different. When you know that you're truly loved, your response to that is different than when it is if you think somebody really despises you and hates your guts. When we truly know that the Father of the universe, the Creator of it all, loves us so much, it causes us to be different once we really understand the depth of his love for us. God loves us even when we're offensive. 
even when we get on the wrong, get up on the wrong side of the bed, we're offensive. We say things we don't mean, say things that we regret, say things that maybe we wanted to say, <laughs> but then we regret later. God loves us even when we're rotten. Even when we're doing the things that we should not do, he still loves us. We've got to receive that love. We've got to apply that love. That's really what salvation is. We love God so much that we understand that his love for us causes us to accept him, to believe on him, and to confess him. I believe that he loves me so much that he wants me to live my life for him. He loves us. We receive God's love. Our dedication to him becomes more loyal. Our consecration to him becomes more founded and more rooted in him when we understand his love. 1 John 4, 19 to 21 says, We love him because he first loved us. He first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. It's only by receiving God's love that we have ability to love others. Should I say that again? It's only out of us receiving God's love that we have the ability to love others. Because we can love others in a way that I love you if you can do this for me. I love you if you act right toward me. I love you if you accept me. And so, so it's always our love, our human love, is contingent on what the other reciprocates. But God's love is love even when there's no reciprocation. God's love is unconditional to the point to where we don't have to earn his love. So we were talking the other day, and, and it's not that we do things to earn God's love, it's that we do things out of response to God's love. God, God loves us so much, and, and his, his love is so unconditional that it makes me want to love him more and to do things. And so we get confused by thinking, well, if you come in, if you're going to be a Christian, before you can be accepted, you must do these things Monday through Friday, eight to five. And then you qualify for the love of God. See, God's love is unconditional. God's love is not based on what we do or don't do, except for two things. We've got to believe and we've got to confess Jesus. That's what he said. Those who believe and those who confess Jesus Christ, they shall be saved. So the price has already been paid for our salvation. Once we do those things, we receive God's salvation. But God's, by receiving God's love causes me then to, it's kind of like when my mom I hated to clean my room, but when my mom told me to clean my room and I knew that she loved me, besides the, the $2 that I was getting on Friday, besides that, I loved her, so I cleaned my room anyway because I loved mom. And so I understood her love for me, and, and I had to, there was, a, under, there was a, there was a progress to that understanding. I didn't immediately understand that. There was a progress to me understanding mom's love for me that I did because I loved her and I thanked her for her love for me. And so our love for God will cause us to do things, but we don't earn God's love by the things we do. Does that make sense? We love because he first loved us. He gives us the ability to love unconditionally. He gives us the ability to love one another without any kind of response back. Because the fact of the matter is, when we walk into the world this afternoon, tomorrow, Tuesday, and Wednesday, when we really get into the world and we try to love people, we'll find out that all they want to do is take advantage. Oh, you love me? I need $100. You love me? I need food. And so we can't say, okay, well, I tried that and that's not for me. I'll be broke by Friday if I do this. You can do one of two things. Three. Number one, pray. Pray. Pray for God's wisdom. And you can help. You can send them either someplace to help or like Chris and I, we were, uh, you've heard the story before. We were in Jacksonville one day and we came to the end of a of an exit and we were at, sitting at the red light and looked over to our left and a young beautiful girl was standing there with a sign that says need money and food and the first thing that hit us was Jordan this beautiful young girl had to be in her 20s looked like she could have been a model she's holding up a sign need food need money so we both had the same urgency at the same time that's somebody's daughter standing right here there's there's a problem rolled the window down and we offered some money I'm sure it didn't buy her an apartment for the next six months, but it was a help. 
Sometimes we can't do what's got to be done, but every little thing that you do. See, God has got you in a place to drop a seed so that the second person can do their job, third that. So we're not called to, to be the Savior for everybody. We're called to do our part. And so our little, our little part will help. Our little part, and, and so we also, outside of that, we said, do you have a church in this area? Do you live here? And she said, yeah. And I don't know the whole story. But she, taught, she, she responded to us, and I said, honey, you need to get yourself in a church, somebody that loves God that will love you and to help, help you through this thing. And I pray every time we come to that exit, every time we come to that exit, we think about her. W- wonder where she's at. We just pray that wherever she's at, she's, she's good. She's okay. And so we're able to love those that are unlovable, just like we were sometimes, just like we are sometimes, that we can love with the love of God, even those that can't reciprocate, can't respond to us, can't. Sometimes you don't even get a thank you. That's okay. Why did we do it? We did it because God first loved us. We can love because he loves us. That's important to forgiveness. It's important to forgiveness because Many times when we forgive, we, we expect a response. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for forgiving me because now I can live my life because you've forgiven me. See, so some, some smart answers like that, sometimes we, we expect that we can get some, some sort of indication back. Many times we can't. But we forgive because of God's love for us, that he forgives us, that we can also forgive without any strings attached. And that freedom in us will cause us to be free in all that we do, to be free in your health, in your relationships. See, all these things, all the hurts that we've all been through, these offenses that we've experienced, if we're not careful, they can hinder us in all these areas. And God wants us free. God wants us to be able to live and to to breathe and to be successful in life in every way, mind, soul, and spirit. We're reminded, I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians 13, 5, talking about love. It says, love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. Love thinks no evil. Love. See, my my prayer today, bottom line, is this, that we draw so close to Jesus that we can love the way Jesus loves. that's That's really what I want us to do is in this world where there's chaos, there's confusion, there's madness, and there's hate everywhere. I mean, it's everywhere that we can represent Jesus Christ to the degree that we're so close to him that we love unconditionally, that we forgive without being asked for forgiveness, and that we're not like Proverbs 18, 19, where when a brother's offended, it's hard to win a strong city. We want to drop the walls down. We want to say, God, I may be hurt from time to time, but I know that you're giving me the strength. You're giving me the strength to surpass this hurt. We see the progression of love. 1 Peter 4, 8. As it brings us unity, it says, and above all these things, 1 Peter 4, 8, all these things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. That's the love that Jesus gave those that were, yes, they were guilty, and yes, it was intentional, and yes, they knew what they were doing, but Jesus said, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. That's the love that he's speaking of here in 1 Peter 4, 8. Love will cover a multitude of sins. There's a freedom in that church that I believe that we need today. In 2021, with everything going on, we can go home and we can cry and we can be upset because things aren't going the way that they should go. And I agree, but you know what? Here we are. We can operate in the love of Christ to where those things aren't attached to us. And we can live and we can be a light to this world if there's ever been a time that this world needs a light. It's today in 2021, April 2021. The world needs a light and you are an important part of that light that Jesus wants to shine through. If you weren't, you wouldn't be here. If you weren't, there would not be God's breath in your body and his blood in your veins. There's a purpose that he wants to live through you. Among other things is to show forth the love of Christ that we can see all the sins around us but we look past the sin and we see the sinner that so needs Christ, just like we do. Amen? Crawford, come.
I want us to stand together. Let's go ahead and stand. I, I want to. I, I, I believe there's. I believe someone's here today that fits in one of these two categories. Maybe you need to experience the forgiveness of Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know, Mike, I, I don't think there's any way in the world that I can be forgiven for the things that I've done. Maybe you've gone past the ability to forgive yourself and you don't think that Jesus can forgive you. I believe there's some here today that needs to receive the forgiveness and the love of Jesus Christ. And it could be that you've been carrying the weight, the pain, the guilt of whatever that thing is. Jesus wants to remove that burden. The Bible says that the burden that Jesus puts on us is not heavy. It's not burdensome at all. It's light. Why? Because he carries the burden. Jesus literally carries the burden of whatever is on your heart and mind today. Whether it's your own sin, whether it's your own fault, or whether it's from the fault of others, there's a release today that I believe that we need to offer up to Jesus. And so there's someone here today, I believe that, that you just need to receive God's forgiveness today. You need to walk in forgiveness and know that God has forgiven you and God loves you. And there's some maybe here today that you're carrying an offense. You're carrying something that's been done against you that is holding you back. And it's a weight that you're just about at your wit's end, carrying the weight, the burden, the guilt, the pain of a betrayal. That is also a burden that Jesus wants to carry. We've got to trust that God will take care of all the details, whatever that means. I can't tell you what that means. It may not be what we want it to mean, but we have to trust God that he will deal with that thing. He promises that he will, but we've got to give room for that to happen. And so maybe you're here carrying the weight of that offense, carrying the weight of that pain. Could have been done to you this past week, could have been done to you 30 years ago. There's a weight that you're carrying today that I believe that the Lord wants to release you from today. And if, that's, if, if you're in either one of those, I want to do something that we haven't done in a long time, except Easter Sunday. I want you to come and stand right here at the front. Just stand right here at the front. If that's you, you need to release something this morning. You don't know what, you may not even know the definition of it. It's okay. Jesus does. Just come stand right here. And what you're saying when you come this morning is that, you know what, I'm ready to release this thing. There's an act of faith that you're saying, Lord, I'm here to release this thing. If that's you, come on and stand with us this morning. Come on and stand. The Lord's wanting you free. The Lord is wanting you free. He's paid the price for your freedom. I'm going to ask Crawford to lead us this morning. And as he leads us, if you feel the unction, I want you to take that step of faith. It's a step of faith. It's not based on what one would say or what one would do. It's based on your relationship with God right now. You're saying, Lord, I'm taking the step of faith to release this thing from my life, to accept your freedom. Crawford, lead us this morning. A thousand stories of love They think you're like To have her The tender whisper of love In the dead of night And you tell me That your peace And that I'm never alone your good, good father, see why, see why, see why, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. I've seen. Searching for answers Far and wide But I know We're all searching for answers Only you provide Because you know Just what we need before You saw world You're good, good father See you are 
Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when the arrogant and evil do doers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. So the generational root will be cursed, burned up, and gone. And a generational curse can cause you to be sick in your body sick in your spirit and in your mind and unforgiveness and woundedness must be burned up, must be released, must be where no root is left behind because then what happens is you'll tread down the wicked and remember <clears throat> the law of Moses but it says that he will send healing on his wings healing and we think of healing only as sometimes as a physical infirmity like a pandemic but Holy Spirit heals every single part of our lives in our broken spirit our brokenness in a broken body in a broken heart and a broken mind and we are to come before him and say, burn it up, Lord. Burn it up like chaff so that nothing is left behind. Nothing remains but your wholeness, your healing goodness, and your perfect, perfect peace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that word. If you will close your eyes, raise your hands to the Lord this morning. The Lord is meeting us right where we are. You've taken the step of faith. You've taken the step of faith. You're standing here before the Lord. God, we raise our hands to you. We don't want to carry this burden anymore. These standing before us this morning do not want to carry this burden. They've taken the step of faith. Saying, Lord, I want to release this. To receive your forgiveness, God, for those things that are there, that are dwelling there, that are holding on. And also carrying offenses 
from others that have been passed down as Miss Nancy just read in Malachi. But we break the ties. We break the ties in Jesus' name of, of that thing that is holding back. Lord, you know what that is. You know exactly what that is. As we raise our hands, Father, we know that you're doing a spiritual operation right now. You're moving things in our lives, God, that you didn't put there. And Lord, you're putting things there that you desire to be there, to give us strength, to give us hope, to experience your love, to walk in forgiveness, to walk in your anointing, to walk in your peace, to have faith to do the things that you've called us to do. Lord, I speak that over every life this morning. Every life this morning, I speak that in Jesus' name. A new freedom, a new peace, a healing that only comes by your hand. And Lord, I pray for an abundance of your blessing now to just pour over every head, every shoulder, every heart. Thank you, Lord, that you pour it out right now in Jesus' name. Like warm oil, God, you bring your healing, you bring that balm, you bring that, that peace, that soothing, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. That the past will be the past, and it's broken off now for a new beginning, a new start. Today is a new day, says the Lord. Today is a new day. Behold, I am doing a new thing in your life today, this moment forward. In the name of Jesus, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. There is a release that's coming right now to release you from those things that you will be seeking after the Lord like you've never sought after him before. He is the answer. He's the hope. He's the life. He's the future. We don't have to know all the details of the answer. We just need to know the one who holds the answer, and that is Jesus Christ today. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing, even right now. Even right now, Father, we love you, Lord. Lord, we dedicate ourselves to you afresh and anew right now. These standing before you is the newness, Father. We receive you. We receive your work. Lord, not to listen to the old voices, but to listen only to you. To draw so close to you, Lord, that we walk in a newness that the things of the world will not have an effect that they did moments ago. There's a newness now, and I thank you that there's a renewing of the mind, there's a renewing of the spirit, and there's a newness coming, Lord, that now will be experienced. And Father, all the glory and all the honor and all the praise is due to you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your word today. I pray that you'll cause it to be hidden in our heart, to take deep root in our lives today so that we're changed from this day forward. Lord, this is not just one meal, this is the first of many that will eat with you that will dive into your word many times a day that will have your word at the edge of our lips so that those times of temptation will come that we will recite that we will read that we'll pray your word Lord recite it back to you Lord because your word is life your word is food for our souls your word is our future your word is our hope I pray may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord cause his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you May the Lord lift the light of his counts upon you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. God bless you. I love you. Have an awesome day in the Lord.